further, just um, as a sense of how competitive uh, the media industry is. Has anybody got any ideas how many applicants we tend to get in the media for an entry level job, say a runner or a trainee or a paid internship? Any guesses how many applicants per job? Give me a thought in the chat box and uh, Catherine will read some of them out for us. Any guesses how many applicants per job that we advertise? What you got? What do you think? Oh, thousands. Mm. Can be. Joe Hayward says thousands. Yeah, it's a good guess. Well, actually, the first time I applied to join the BBC was on a trainee ship. There were nine places, and I think we got about 10,000 applicants. So it probably was about thousands, yeah. Yeah, but that was a long time ago. Any other guesses, anyone? Okay. Oh, 50. 50, yeah, that's not a bad guess as well. It does tend to vary for the most prestigious organisations like the BBC. Um it can be higher but uh, oh Nadia absolutely on normally it's about 100 sort of rolling average about 100 applications for every single job uh, which is a bit scary isn't it it tells you you're up against a lot of competition some of those will be discounted very quickly because they won't have the right qualifications or experience as we'll discuss but it's just an important point to bear in mind from the very start media is intensely competitive one of the most competitive professions to get into you will be up against a lot of other people trying to get into it as well. It means your applications have to be really, really good to even get past the first stage. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today. Hopefully help you a little bit with um, your applications and make sure they are good and they stand out. For those of you who don't know me and didn't come to um, the first one of these, which was sort of an introduction to media, I'm Simon Hall. I was a BBC news correspondent for 20 years. I've also been a BBC producer, news editor, and I worked in ITV and independent radio as well. So today, media applications. What I'm going to do is take you through a BBC traineeship application, um, simply because the questions that come up in this will come up in any other, whether it's ITV, whether it's newspapers, whether it's on the website or whatever. You tend to get the same questions coming up time and time again. So I'm going to take you through some of them. And we'll draw out the principles, the important points that you should be looking to actually nail in your application to make sure it has a good chance of success. So the first thing we do in the media, one of the most uh, important principles of the media is the opening of any story we, we write. The opening line is critical because there's a lot of competition for people's attention. So the opening has to be really good, strong, interesting to lure the audience in. So the first thing you need to think about with the media application is the opening question. It's an important filter point, because if you don't get this right, you could get discarded before you get any further. And the opening question is always a stinker, and it's a deliberately so a stinker in order to see how you are, whether you're fitted, whether you have the right qualifications, whether you have the right experience. So I will give you the opening question from a BBC application, which I think was last year or the year before. And I'd like you just to think for a couple of minutes. You don't have to write the answer out. But just think for a couple of minutes about what you would put in the answer to this question if you are filling out your application. So in only 100 words, why should we give you a place on the journalism trainee scheme? What would you bring to the BBC? How about that for a stinker to start with? So you only get 100 words. It's probably four or five sentences. What are you going to say in there which will make the person who's reading your application think, yep, this is worth reading on to the next part of the application. This person has got a chance of getting in and becoming a BBC journalist. So just think for a couple of minutes, what sort of things would you put in there? And remember, you've only got 100 words. This is not academia where you can go on and on and on to make a point. It's got to be short, sharp, really concise and really effective. So have a think about that for a couple of minutes. And then if you are willing to contribute, um, type into the chat box a yes or a me or an okay and we will take a note of who wants to contribute and then we or you will unmute and uh, you can give us your thoughts. As I say, I don't expect you to write out the hundred words. Obviously you're gonna agonize about that for a while, but just think what sort of points would you put in there? And then we'll have a look at some of the principles about what you should put in there when we've heard from some of you. So if you're ready to give us some ideas, stick us an okay or a yes or a me in the chat box and then we'll hear from you. Oh, look at that. Look at that, Catherine. Flora already. Good Lord. All right, Flora. Great. We'll just give it a little bit longer, Flora, so we can see if we can hear from anyone else as well. But thanks very much for volunteering to go first. That's a good sign. 
just think what are the critical things you should put in that that opening uh, question some, pe some people are putting their answers in the question and answer box rather than the chat if you could keep to the chat that would be really useful um oh. then looking for things in the one place yeah remember you're dealing with people of less brain power than you so <laughs> I'm not always good at multi-screening or multitasking. Yeah, uh, he, he knows come up with some good things, but if you could put them in the chat, that would be lovely. Yeah, and let's hear from you as well. Um, it's really important. If you're going to be a journalist, you have to have the courage to be able to speak up in front of others. Yeah, but some, some of them can't because I can't oh. unmute them. Yeah. I mean, there have been cafes and all that sort of thing, won't you? So, yeah. But anyway, we'll hear from you somehow. So have a little bit longer. If anybody else wants to contribute, give us a yes or an okay. All right, so um, Catherine, you said that, um, all right, so we've got a couple of people willing to contribute and some ideas. Okay, Catherine, give, give us a couple of the um, things that people have written first. All right, all. Eno is the one that put those in the Q&A and has transferred it, so thank you. Um, multidisciplinary, out-of-the-box thinking and a different perspective. Yeah, really um, good. Originality, yeah, very good. Multidisciplinary, out-of-the-box thinking, yeah, really, really good. Problem solving. Uh, yeah. Sophie, Sophie has put, what differentiates you from other candidates? What makes you unique and completely individual? Good, yeah, good. Uh, Lucy is happy to contribute. If oh, wow. you're somebody who's, um, unfortunately, some of you I can't unmute because your, your Zoom is an old version of Zoom. Um, but Lucy, if you can, unmute and let us know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Just let come through. Um, I was just going to say I've had some experience on um, things like student radio committees. Um, so I'd be looking to build on existing skills that I've developed with more professional development. Could I Great. say something like that? Absolutely critical. Yeah, you've nailed one of the most important, if not the most important points, the fact that you have experience. Well done. Thank you. Anything else you thought? Um, that's all. Because the last one was, I'm not sure my microphone works. Oh, Flora. We were going to see if Flora could talk to us. Oh, yes, Flora. Can you speak to us, Flora? Um, yeah, you can hear Excellent. me. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, I, was, I just looked, I just got up the like trainee scheme on the BBC website and it um, it really like, stresses being flexible and adaptable, um, like the sense of it being a fast paced environment so that you have to change what you're doing for the time. So being able to demonstrate the ability to do that. Great. And what you've mentioned there as well, um, you did some research, you read around, not just actually tried to answer it, but looked at ways to answer it, what the BBC are, are looking for. And so often you should address yourself to the question and some of the uh, hints they give you. So that's really, really good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Well, did we get anything else in chat box or anywhere else, um, Catherine? Um, no. Oh, Claire says a willingness to learn. Ah, and Rosalind has got her hand up. Um, so... Uh, do you want to talk to us, Rosalind? Sure. I, I thought if we're, um, yeah, if we're throwing our hats in the ring, um, I'd say I'm a self-starter who's um, sought out opportunities as a freelance journalist and worked with my local community to edit and publish a book. Um, I'm passionate about finding stories and um, bringing them to wider audiences, something like that. Yeah, really good. What do we think, Catherine? You're nodding away. Sounds good to me to you? It sounds good to me. Yeah, really good. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Very good. Okay, so thanks for those contributions. You're thinking absolutely along the right lines. These are the principles that you should be looking at. And it's sort of encapsulated in that box there, which is another question you will nearly always be asked. They want to know about your journalist experience, whether that's for the BBC or ITV, Channel 4, newspapers, because it's so competitive, you really are going to struggle to get in unless you have experience. So the first thing you should think about is getting some student experience. Um, Cambridge has got some fantastic student media. So whether it's newspapers, online, radio, TV, get some experience because questions like that, we want to know about your journalist experience, whether it's been writing for newspapers, websites, radio station, blogger, vlogger, social media content, digital videos, worked as a freelance journalist. That's absolutely critical. And that's the cornerstone of your application and i'm not going to say you won't get through the application process unless you've got that but it's very unlikely because you'll be up against a lot of other people who will have that 
and the BBC certainly, and I know other organisations look for it. And that's the foundation of show not tell, evidence-based answers. Anyone can say they're passionate about the media, but not anyone can actually show it by doing a lot of experience while you're at university, by getting work experience in the professional sphere, by creating your own videos. It's so easy these days to film and edit videos and set them up on your social media channel. You've got to really show your commitment. So that's the key point for me, particularly in that opening question, show not tell, evidence-based answers. Show us that you're committed to being a journalist by virtue of the experience you have. Other principles to look at, understand the organization and yourself. This is probably gonna come up a little later in the application and possibly in the interview, um, but it's good to understand the organization. Uh, the BBC, for example, has some pretty strict editorial principle, if you might not always think so, uh, but it does. Um, so understand the ethos of the organization, public service broadcasting and how you fit into it. Are you public servant type minded person? It's good to understand the organization. I wouldn't want to go into an interview with somewhere like the BBC or any other media outlet without knowing a fair bit about them. Know the job as well. Um, and we were hearing about what the BBC says it's looking for, which is self-starters. Flexibility is really, really important. Taint a nine to five job. If you want a nine to five job where everything is routine and predictable, the media is not for you. It's different every single day. You're always problem solving. You're always being challenged. You're always having to think on your feet. And understanding the job is really, really important. Show your dedication. And that comes with relevant work experience, um, creating videos, doing social media, blogging. That's important as well. And hunger for news. <laughs> Journalists are expected to know the news agenda because it's very possible you could just be into the office one day and you're out interviewing the Prime Minister so you better know what the running stories are of the moment so you can put those points to the Prime Minister if you get chucked into that contest. So a wide range of knowledge and knowing what's going on in the news. So those are the principles, principles behind your answer of that stinker of an opening question and a lot of the other questions. Show not tell, make sure you've got the experience there, understand the organisation you're applying to, do your research, find out about it, know the job, know yourself, show your dedication and be hungry for news, okay? Another thing which is common, um, and it's, it's easy to do now in this new online world you're also used to, but us dinosaurs have had to get used to, is that um, we can put you through an application process online and actually give you deadlines and make you react and think on your feet. So you will often get scenarios. Um, the BBC application will often start with the opening question, which you'll have as much time for as you like, within reason, maybe a couple of days, maybe a bit longer. But then they will throw questions at you, which you only have a very limited time for. And they're often scenarios. So I'm going to give you an example of a scenario from a BBC application, I think, two years ago now. And then I'm going to give you 90 seconds in order to answer it. So have a look at this question. We'll have a look at 90 seconds worth of time to think about it. And then again, let's hear when you're ready, stick a yes or an okay or a me in the chat box and we'll hear what you think. So here's your scenario. Ready for this? You're a trainee journalist at the BBC. Overnight, there was heavy snowfall in your area, which is top news story of the day. When you arrive at work, you find half of the newsroom journalists couldn't get in because of the snow. Your boss asks you to go out and film some footage on your mobile phone of the snowy conditions, but you've never had to do this before. What do you do next? 90 seconds. Think about that. And if you want to give us an answer, type OK or yes in the chat box, and then we'll hear from some of you. 90 seconds only. Sixty seconds. Time goes really fast when you're up against a deadline. We had some that had an answer within thirty seconds. <laughs> That's really good. Really good. Really good. Okay. Forty-five seconds. Good, so we've got some nice offers of contributions. Good, good, good. And we've got another 25 seconds. Oh, I'd like to be all so polite. I ask for a yes or a, a, a me, and you say lovely things like happy to contribute. Oh, no, it's oh, really It is kind, isn't it? 
really nice little things like that. Last 10 seconds. And that is it. That's your 90 seconds. So, Catherine, just give us a sense of what a couple of people have written. Right. Starting at the top with Eno, uh, we have um, who would contact someone who is used to doing this and ask them for any tips or guidance. Good, 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 good. And where would be the first place you think you would start for that? Tips and guidance. Well, uh, Fiona's come up with contact someone who's done it before and ask her what you should be doing. Um, and Lucy says, take the initiative and use resources such as friends with experience and YouTube to work out what to do. Don't absolutely don't say no. Uh, Lucy, really good answer. No yes. is not a word you ever want to hear. And particularly in the journalist context, you should be able to do it. I have no, no idea what I'm doing. Give me. Yeah. And we'll go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And Sarah's come up with it depends on how long your boss has given you. If you have enough time, you could research locations where the snowfall is particularly dramatic or around well-known landmarks in the area that will be eye-catching for the viewer. So she's thinking really visually as well, which is great. Yep, yeah. yeah. and it's a visual story, isn't it? Great, okay. So who was gonna contribute for us? Okay, we've got, first up was, Ma oh no, Shannon, Shannon Rawlins. Yeah. Welcome along, Shannon. Are you one that can speak? Uh, let me have a look. Um, possibly not. If you can't, Quickly type it and I'll read it out for you if, you, yeah. if you're Zoom listening to you speak. Thanks, Shannon. Sorry about that. Is anybody else? We, um... yeah, Matilda? Matilda was happy to contribute. Um, again, it depends how long you've got, but maybe have a quick look through like previous content around similar stories that maybe they've published in the past to see what kind of images they're looking for um, and then go out and do it yourself. But maybe maybe get in contact with friends or put something on social media asking for people to send in their own photos of the snowfall they've got in their home and how it's affecting them good, good lateral thinking really good so get them to do the work for you works really well <laughs> in the social media no, it's great it's a really good piece of lateral thinking they could do it better because they've got it outside their front door great idea yeah and sophie carlin um yeah can you hear me yeah. yep yeah, I guess from a logistical point of view as well, like you need to make sure that you're kind of dressed appropriately so you can like stay out and actually do the filming and that like your phone has enough charge and enough storage and everything, just kind of like being kind of practical and organized and making sure you have everything you need to be successful. Good, 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 oh, good. Yeah, good. So we got anyone else who can contribute? Uh, I think yeah, Charlotte. Um, yeah, I think definitely using uh, other journalists that might not have been able to get in the newsroom, but are in their local, their kind of like local area and kind of work as a team to get different images um, into you that you can use. So you're not necessarily trying to do it all yourself. You can kind of work as a team and do it together. Great. Slam dunk answers. Really, really good. Just interesting. If you're not happy about how to film, you don't know how to film on your phone. Um, who would you ask in that scenario if you're under time pressure? Ask oh, Siri. <laughs> well, it's not a bad answer, actually. Always ask the people around you first. They can often help you. They can often help your editor. Say, look, I've never done it before, but I'll go and do it. What? Give me five quick tips about how to make it work. OK. I think Nathan raised his hand as well. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Loud and clear. Um, yeah. No, I mean... Obviously, you know, these newsrooms are all very busy and the boss is probably a very busy person. But if they, you know, and obviously everybody's been talking about asking other people for help. I mean, is it the worst thing in the world just to, you know, as they ask you that question, just ask, you know, very small, more specific questions of them to find out exactly what they're looking for? I mean, okay. surely if they're giving you a task and you've never done it, like, can't, you know, would they be completely against the idea of giving you a little bit more guidance in terms of what exactly they're looking for? Just ask them. So give me 30 second rundown. Um, really basic things like you hold the phone in that aspect. You know, you hold the shot steady rather than swinging around. I would certainly do that if I was editing you and I was asking that. And that's a perfectly good question. Well done, Nathan. Great. OK, so some really good stuff there. Key point that comes out is no is not a word you ever want to hear in this context. There is always a way of doing something. It just takes being a bit resourceful, thinking about it and saying, well, how can we do this? We may never have met this situation before, but we can certainly do something. Good. Really, really good answers. OK, um, so moving on through the application, strategic and analytical thinking. This will also come out. Um, you are, as a reporter, not just reporting what happens. You're also expected to give us the context of it. 
why it's important. They analyze and interpret, reporters do. It's not just the story, it's the depth of the story, the resonance, what it really means. And of course, in the BBC specifically, and in other organizations, when we're recruiting, we're not just recruiting for reporters and correspondents. We've been looking for editors, program producers, perhaps even the next director general. They do often come via this route. So we really want to see your strategic and analytical thinking. So with that in mind, here is a question which will often come up. So again, have a think for this about, um, think about this for a couple of minutes. And then if you're happy to contribute what you might think the answer would be to this one, then give us a yes or a me in the chat box and we'll hear from you again. At the BBC, we're keen to recruit journalists who can help us connect with all of our audiences right across the UK. In our reporting, we want to appeal to people from all walks of life. How can you help us to attract audiences from diverse backgrounds who would not normally turn to the BBC to find out what's going on in the news? So this is a really live issue in the BBC at the moment. The BBC is worried about its audience being older and therefore tailing off because um, basically we fade away after a while. Um, so how do we reach out to other people, particularly younger people, particularly communities we don't actually serve as well and who don't turn to us for news? That is a very standard question and that is testing your strategic and analytical thinking and your knowledge of the industry. So have a think about that. Have a little bit longer to think about that and then give us a yes or an okay if you've got an answer give us some ideas of what you would do for that one and that is a very very standard question and it's also a clever question because it tests your strategic thinking your insights your knowledge the depth of your understanding of the media and the context oh i do like working with you you're so keen to contribute that's great Okay, so we've got a couple of offers. I'm going to give it another 45 seconds or so if anybody else wants to, um, to speak out or pop their thoughts into the chat box. Okay, so Catherine, what have we got for this one? First of all, what do we have uh, a... You again, who would like to contribute. Okay. Can you speak, though? <laughs> you have who the power. Who was that? Who was that? You know at the top. Um, is that me? Yeah, could be you. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So I was thinking perhaps one could contact social media uh, influencers who are important for those groups and ask them to refer to BBC News um, in their social media websites. Great, um, great. Good answer. Or even contribute to some of the BBC's output because it's a viewpoint which isn't often heard, is it? And that will bring the audiences with them. Really good. Good answer. Thank you. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. I'm going to write that down. Keep that one up your sleeve. Yeah, uh, Natasha has talked about using social media and Facebook groups. Good. Um, and similarly, Nadia, an understanding of a wider range of social media trends and platforms to reach younger audiences. Um, and Claire Walsh was happy to contribute. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, um, you know, thinking about targeting social media even when kind of filming the normal news because I think videos work particularly well so I kind of hate to say the word sound bites but if you can kind of deliver the news in a way which can be easily translated to posting on social media then that's probably uh, the best way to get it out there good good answer yeah absolutely good thank you thank you yeah, Lucy was saying it, she thinks it's important to consider who is writing and commissioning material and also then who is then performing or presenting it. Yeah, sometimes we are uh, a bit of a lacking in diversity mindset in the BBC and that's a problem which has been noticed. Well done. And Sarah, um, Sarah Swift mentioned that um, to highlight any experience you have in communicating through non-traditional mediums like social media i.e. if you've run social media for organisations or charities before, you could then transfer and use those skills to working at the BBC. Good. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. I mentioned using a real variety of social media platforms, not just the obvious, especially TikTok, 
um, having seen a BBC journalist, um, Sophia Smith Geller, using TikTok as a very effective platform to reach audiences who wouldn't normally watch the TV news. Good, and good evidence based answer as well shows you're noticing what's going on and thinking about it. Really good. Yeah. And, and Harry was talking about tailoring the language and the style to different platforms and the expected audience, not just one report, but written very differently to reach um, each audience and reach more people. Good. Yeah, yeah, it should be inclusive rather than exclusive writing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Should anybody so, else want to contribute? Nobody else wants to contribute at the moment, but a lot of them can't can't actually speak. Um, I'm trying to get to the bottom of that um, while you're talking, but um, at the moment they can't, unfortunately. Um, Lucy was going to add something, um, and Shannon was talking about introducing more younger reporters and newsreaders to the BBC, and also Rosalind multilingual content. Yeah, good. It is a problem, of course, that the older people tend to run the place because we're more experienced and we rise up the ranks. And sometimes we have got complete blind spots about what it means to be young. So absolutely right. Very good point. Yeah. I'm going to mute myself to try and get to the bottom of unmuting everybody else. If that's all right. Okay, well, don't, don't leave me. We were just doing a good job. <laughs> good. So just going to have a look. Um, Lucy, you say uh, text and sign language. Super important. Yeah, good point. Good points. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Good stuff. OK, so bear in mind um, that uh, strategic thinking, um, being a thinker, an analyst, a strategic thinker, knowing the industry, identifying the current issues, um, that really helps you as well, because questions like that specifically with the BBC will come up. We want people who are thinkers and who can join the BBC and go right through the ranks and become some of the most senior we have. Um, so well worth thinking analytically and strategically. Good. OK, um, so let's do another scenario because I like to pitch these in because um, this is how the application proceeds. You can think everything is going smoothly and then you can hit another scenario. So uh, this time again, we will give you, uh, let's say, another 75 seconds because I'm feeling meaner this time. And you were so good last time for this scenario. So when I reveal this scenario, 75 seconds. And then again, if you want to contribute, give us a yes or an OK in the chat box. Here is your scenario. You're a journalism trainee working at the Beeb. You have to be in the office by nine tomorrow morning. There's a 24 hour public transport strike planned for tomorrow starting at midnight tonight. The last time there was a strike, there was minimal impact to your journey. But what's your course of action? 75 seconds. Have a think. And if you've got a plan, pop it in the chat box and we'll come to you. Forty five seconds. Okay, last fifteen seconds. Catherine, are you going to be free to help me with some of the feedback for this one? You are. You're still there. You haven't left me. Oh, no, I'm still here. I'm just hoping someone's going to get back to me. Okay. <laughs> Where were... Last few seconds, and then let's hear some of the um, contributions. So we've got some nice text in there, and also I think Sophie's happy to contribute. So, Catherine, work it your way. What should we hear? Okay. Starting at the top with Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, oops, Charlotte said, let your boss know and ask if you can use the travel disruptions as a story and maybe a vlog your experience of trying and failing to get to work. What a great answer that is. Brilliant. Brilliant one. Really good. Um, Sarah said to try and stay overnight nearer to work with friends and co-workers. Um, and um, Eno wondered whether the BBC had any insider knowledge on what the strikers were planning. Another a good turn on the story. Yeah, it's a good answer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Flora is going to... Um, <laughs> Use her contact and use a more senior colleague to to network and get them in the car. <laughs> in their car. <laughs> um, Harriet um, was talking about planning alternative routes that would take a similar amount of time and let other people in the workplace know about this in advance. So leaving earlier would also be good. 
Um, other people are talking, about, Fiona is talking about a backup plan, get up earlier than normal to catch an earlier train to allow for delays. And Sophie is happy to contribute. Well, let's hear. Um, yeah, I, a lot of what's been said so far is what I'd come up with, but um, I also put down that you kind of can't take the last time as a guarantee. And if you can maybe try and carpool with someone um, and you can also maybe use it as an opportunity for kind of networking as well. You know, maybe get in contact with a colleague you haven't spoken to as much and kind of getting to know them more um, and creating a bit of a connection there as well for professional purposes. Great. OK, but the, the key question, what is the thing you don't do, Sophie? What is the one thing you do not do? You always make sure that you're able to get to work. You can't be you need to be organized and punctual. That's absolutely right. Yeah. The number of times I went into a situation, we had a plan, but we had a fallback plan, and the fallback plan, and the fallback plan. So long as something got on air and something got done. And that's absolutely right. So well done. You've all seen straight through that one. There is no room in the media for thinking, oh, yeah, everything will be all right. Um, you hope for the best. That's fine. But you always plan for the worst. <coughs> Sorry? Andrew was going to tap into the BBC budget to ask if they can sponsor an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> I think you deserve it for that answer. Biking and um, yeah, borrowing a bicycle. So other other means of transport, basically. Great. Okay. Good. So um, resilience, persistence, um, resourcefulness, really, really important. Really important in the media. I mean, generally in life, but particularly treasured qualities in the media. Great. Really good. Well done. Okay. Uh, there are some classic questions which come up in applications all the time, and this is one of them. Absolutely classic questions. So again, for this one, have a think just briefly for this one. Um, just give me an idea. And this is a question which doesn't matter where you apply to in the media, you will get this question. So you better be prepared for it. With our BBC audiences in mind, please suggest an original idea for a news story. Explain how it would be presented on all the following BBC news platforms. News online, BBC digital video, online, the television news and radio news. So have a think about that. What they're testing there is whether you've got a story you can bring to the party is often the case that you have a morning news meeting and we're a little bit shorter news so ideas are always welcome creativity and ideas are welcome but also in the bbc it used to be the case that i worked for the six o'clock news which was nice and straightforward it was one bulletin per day on the tv by the end i was working for news online and radio and tv and everything so you have to be able to understand the different demands of different media so have a minute to think about that um, and then if you've got an idea for us again hit the um chat a box and give us an okay or a yes or you're happy to contribute but always when you go into an, an application for the media always have an idea for a news story and not just an idea but how you would treat it whether it's for radio tv or online and also bear in mind these days that if you wanted to work for the guardian the guardian are now broadcasters as well because on their website they will often carry interviews and, and video footage it used to be that there were broadcasters and there were publishers but now broadcasters are publishers and publishers are broadcasters. The BBC puts vast resource into its website, which of course is basically publishing. And now the newspapers put vast resources into their website where they can carry audio and video as well. So everybody does the whole lot. It's the homogeny of the internet. Everything has come together because of the internet. Broadcasters are publishers and publishers are broadcasters. So have a think for a minute. A story for the BBC news platforms. And how would you do it differently from radio and television, online, and maybe social media type video? This is a tough question, but this will always come up in any application. So you should always have an answer ready. Let's see if we've got any thoughts on that one. Ah, a bit more tricky this time. I always feel good if I can actually quiet you for at least a few seconds. It means you're having to think about it. Now, are we going to have anyone who wants to contribute? Ah, oh, Rosalind. Rosalind's got the top tips from residents of the Outer Hebrides about social isolation. Fantastic idea. Okay, yeah, isn't that great? Because, of course, you, they're used to it much more. Okay, Rosalind, um, let's push you a bit further then. So how would that be different from TV, from radio? How would you do it differently for those two? Uh, well, I, uh, 
Oh, so, sorry, I interrupted you, but it's really, really nice. I could immediately start <laughs> to see it as a story. Yeah, go on. How would you do it differently for radio and TV? Uh, well, I guess radio would really lend itself to um, actual interviews and sound bites with local residents, or maybe television. You might be able to lean into more of um, a traditional format where a news anchor goes and you get um, a lot of nice visuals of the islands and that kind of thing, which could be of interest to a broader UK audience. Great. Um, so it, it might just be about the proportion of um, spoken content as opposed to visual content mainly. You're thinking well about the difference between the two mediums. Um, obviously TV, you could see the isolation of the Hebrides. How would you get it across on the radio, the fact that it was much quieter, much more isolated? What would you do? Uh, maybe I'm just thinking of um, almost like uh, audio audio books and programs, but you could probably actually just get a soundbite of the the wind and someone, mm. um, you know, then kind of talking and saying, this is the sound of blah, blah, blah. Um, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And it might sound self-evident to you now, but it's really, really important to understand the difference um, between radio, TV and online and how you make it work for those different platforms. Radio producers think with their ears, what does this sound like? You know, what, 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 how do I make this scene really picture people's imaginations? That's really good. Excellent. Thank you, Rosalind. Really good idea. I like that a lot. Keep that one up your sleeve. That's a nice one. Thanks. Uh, Sophie has come up with an idea of, of the differences in, in studying in lockdown. Um, having seen a girl on TikTok who is hosting live study sessions. And there's also a group of 18 YouTubers who are running an account called the StudyTube Project, where they're creating content to keep students occupied and engaged during lockdown. Yeah. Really good, really good. And I like that as well, because you brought your unique younger perspective to the BBC and the old senior editors and executives wouldn't know that. It's very unlikely they would know that. So that's a good idea. And also it builds on what we were discussing earlier on about reaching out to underserved audiences, which is great. Really good, a couple of great answers. Well done, really, really good. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on now because I've got another couple of scenarios I wanna play with you um, just quickly because scenarios are really important. Um, in interviews and in applications, there are time limits and you're expected to think on your feet because that reflects the reality of the job. And then we're gonna to draw together some themes that have come out uh, from our discussions about how to apply for media jobs. And then we'll have time for some questions as well. So another scenario, and because you've been eating these alive and not ruffled by them at all, I'm only gonna give you 60 seconds for this one. So are you ready for this scenario? In 60 seconds, you're a journalism trainee working on BBC Radio News Programme. You booked a taxi to pick up a guest who is due to be live on the radio show at five o'clock. But you get a call from them at 4.15 to say their taxi hasn't turned up. You've been on shift since six in the morning and you're due to go home. What do you do? One minute. And again, pop something in the chat box if you want to contribute either live or just write some text in for us. Well, I think I can hear someone typing. Or is that you, Catherine? Yeah, me. <laughs> 30 seconds. What are you chuckling about? Harry's come up with a lovely one. <laughs> <laughs> Harry's feeling impatient. Yeah. Harry's going to the taxi company and tell them to get a move on. <laughs> or they don't get the BBC business anymore. Okay, that's 60 seconds. That's a good one. Okay, what else have we got? Sarah says, book another taxi, or if they're too far away, set up a Zoom call that can be recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nathan, first thing to contact them and work out the timings to see if it's still possible to get them on. Um, Claire, you must stay at work until they're safely there. Don't go home, basically. Call the taxi company to make sure the booking is still on and they're on their way. If not, order the guest an Uber. When they arrive, apologise that they have to wait. And Fiona also says, don't go home. Come up with a plan, call another taxi to go and pick them up and make sure they get to where they're due to be. They can always call into the radio to fill in time, twist on the news story. Right. And again, you know, it's about an Uber or a taxi, you can get them there on time. 
um, and ask me if they have any other means, provided I do not have a car of my own. Ask the BBC if they've got any vehicles. Um, whatever you do, don't go home. Um, don't go home until you've sorted it. Um, call up the taxi company. Also get in touch with the radio producer. That's a good one from Shannon to let them know the situation. Communication is key. Good, really good. Really yeah. good. So resourcefulness, never giving up. Absolutely critical. Never giving up. Never going away and leaving it be. Yeah, and, and having a plan B. Good. A bit about filler time as well. Referring back to what I did to you earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I deserved it. Don't worry. That's great. Yeah, really good. Resourcefulness, never giving up. Always finding a way. There is always a way. And as you say, it might not be as good to have them on the phone as in the studio, but it's sure better than not having anything at all. So really good. Yeah, good. Resourcefulness, preparation and planning. Excellent. Excellent. Really well done. Um, by the way, I will um, give you copies of this presentation, um, which Catherine will have, uh, so she can send it out to you as well if you are going to apply for media jobs so you can see some of these scenarios and practice ready for them. Good. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll do one more, one more scenario because they're quite good fun. They're good training and good testing. And then we'll draw the themes together from this um, presentation and then we'll have time for questions. So again, this time, 60 seconds on this scenario. You're a BBC journalism trainee working with digital video team. Been assigned to look after a colleague who's working with the team for the first time. Your boss asks you to work with them on a project, but on starting the task, which involves editing a number of video clips, it becomes apparent they have little editing experience and you have to finish the work to a tight deadline. Hmm, dilemma. What do you do? One minute. See what you come up with with this one. What's your priority and what else have you got to think about? Thirty seconds remaining. Last fifteen seconds. What have you got then? What are you going to do? And again, fill in the chat box or say yes or okay if you want to contribute. Oh, they're struggling with this one. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't okay. it? Um, Nathan's, uh, no, Fiona, oh, let me hold still. Uh, Fiona says the deadline is the most important thing. There's always something to learn. So invite the trainee to watch you edit and maybe explain as you go along and allow them to do anything that they can. And once the deadline has been met, sit down and see what they need to learn and help them. What a good answer. So you've got priorities absolutely right, but also good diplomacy and humanity as well. Great. Very good. Nathan come up with something similar about the priority is meeting the deadline. And the second priority is their learning. Um, so involve them as much as you can so it doesn't slow the process down. Uh, similarly, you know, we show them how to use the video editing software and then estimate whether they can do the job. And if not, um, they would do it and notify the superiors so they don't give them such duties next time or give them some training first. Yeah, good. Honesty, diplomacy, but priorities as well. Good. Um, Harry says do it yourself and have them shadow you on the project and be open to their ideas and questions and talk them through what you're doing so they can learn on the job um, mm. and Lucy was going to identify someone in the team who can do this quickly and use it as a teaching moment let the new member supervise the editing and contribute without shouldering the responsibility Very that, good. yeah because your blurb didn't identify whether you were capable of doing the editing yourself I think we're assuming that yeah yes <laughs> Yeah. Really good answers, yeah. So identify the priority, which is obviously to get the thing on there. That's always the priority. Then after that, <coughs> diplomacy, um, feelings. Yeah, you're still a human being. Journalists are often accused of not being human, but we tend to try to be. Um, so that's really good. Really, really good answers. Okay, so great. Some good scenarios, um, some good questions, and some really, really good answers. So drawing, drawing together the themes, the themes of your application, the media applications. Um, be a news junkie and committed to the journalism life. It's worth now getting into the habit of reading the BBC News site, the, um, the Times, The Guardian, whatever you want to do every morning, and also occasionally dipping your toe into the tabloids as well. 
they're not my favorite but they do some interesting things and some of that populist stuff is worth knowing about um so get across the news get to know who the big players are what the running stories are and that will help you when you go to do applications and then go into an interview that you don't have to cram madly for a couple of days be committed to the journalism life so get the work experience in place um, and get the student media in place as well and start doing some blogging start doing some social media if you don't already learn how to video edit it's not difficult okay so that's one of the key themes that comes out know the organization its values and history consume the output and think about it particularly with the bbc you often get asked a question in the interview about the history of the bbc or what the BBC's ethos is or who John Reith was or something like that. Nothing too hard if you've read a bit about the organisation, but knowing about it, its values and its history and looking at its output, we might ask you, what's your favourite BBC output? Is it Radio 1? Is it the 10 o'clock news on the TV? Is it the news channel? Is it comedy? You know, what is it? Think about the values of the organisation and what it does. Know it. Reaching underserved audiences is important and will continue to be so. So think about how you would do that. The problem with too many old people like me who are in charge and um, getting younger voices in there, more diverse voices in there. That's important. Social media is ever growing in importance. Um, don't go into an interview or an application for a media job without having a media presence on social. Uh, Twitter tends to be the outlet of choice of journalists. It's where most of them are because most of the big business people and politicians and sports people and showbiz and that are there as well. But um, have a social media presence and a good understanding of it. And know the job in yourself. The job is not routine. It's not boring. It's not predictable. It's always changing. Um, it can be stressful. There are big deadlines, unpredictable hours, lots of demands. So you've got to know what the job is and know yourself. Are you suited for this? Are you adaptable, flexible? Are you determined but still calm? Are you resilient and resourceful? Do you have a can-do attitude? See how those themes come out time and time again in the questions that you're asked in the media application. Okay. So finally, um, your strategy, uh, BBC and other journalism traineeships. There's a list which I think is reasonably up to date. And Catherine, I think you've probably got a list of all the traineeships as well, haven't you? I, um, I think it's a point to general resources. It's more comprehensive. Good. OK, um, it's here and you can click on it if you want a copy of this presentation. It's here for you. Just one word of warning. Um, don't hold your hat on getting a traineeship. They're really, really competitive. They're really hard to get into. You will be up against people with more experience than you. It was quite common when I was in the B that we had barristers and GPs and other medics applying to become journalists. Um, don't let that put you off because you can still get in. And I've, I've seen some of the students I've worked with get in, but it is competitive. So be realistic about it. Um, and there's a resource uh, list of all other traineeships there. It's more likely you will do a master's in journalism um, as your plan B. <laughs> there are two places in, in the UK where the best master's courses are, and that's City in London and uh, Cardiff, uh, part of the University of Wales. I went to Cardiff. Many of my colleagues go to City. Nothing is guaranteed in this world, but you're as near as can be guaranteed to getting a media job if you come out of those two. They're the best ones by far. Uh, thoroughly recommended. I know it's a pain. I know it's more money. I know it's another year. I would be doing you a disservice if I told you you could get in otherwise. Um, you would be expected to have that if you don't get a traineeship. Okay, so that's your strategy. And uh, in terms of um, that uh, talk, I hope that was helpful. It gives you some of the themes of uh, how to apply for the media, some of the principles of it, some of the things they look for, and some experience of the scenarios and the questions. And so if you go for it, good luck. Uh, but for now, I try and leave a little bit of time at the end, which we have. Uh, so if you've got any questions, ping them either in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask us, and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Rosalind, unmute yourself. Go ahead. Hi. Um, this is a slightly specific question, but I, I thought I'd just ask. Um, I'm actually British Australian. I've spent a lot of time in Australia most of my life. And in that sense, I'm not really affiliated with any particular part of the UK. Is that a disadvantage or an advantage from applying for something like the BBC? No, the BBC is an international organisation. It's not a disadvantage at all. Um, we have a couple of correspondents in Australia. You might notice there's a lot of Australian news on the BBC. We seem to have a sort of closeness with Australia for a variety of reasons. Um, it's no, it, it's all about your, your character and your ability and your experience and your determination these days. Um, when I joined the BBC, it was a lot more white. It was a lot more middle class. It was a lot more a certain type of person. 
and it tended to be very British and actually not just British to be frank but southern English um, accents from Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland were very unusual these days you listen to the BBC you hear wonderful diversity of accents um, across the world service across the world with a wonderful diversity of backgrounds so it's no problem for you whatsoever it's about you your ability your determination your experience that's what it's all about okay great thank you very much and Natasha has a question. Um, in terms of new story ideas, can you build on current stories and take them further, or do you really have to have be completely innovative? No, we love the idea of taking a current story and finding a new, fresh, interesting way of doing it. I mean, if anybody could find a different way of doing Brexit, for example, I'm sure they would be hugged because we're all sick to the back teeth of it. Um, yeah, something different, something in you have a new angle. You might have heard something from someone. You might have thought something. Yeah, new angles are really, really good. No problem with that at all. So it has to be just something which is interesting and works well as a story. It could be fresh and innovative. It could be a new take on a story. And Sarah, are you able to unmute? Uh, yes, I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, was that a yes? Yes, we got you. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Sorry that I checked. Um, this is quite a specific one. I was just wondering, uh, looking at some internships for kind of next summer, and I've noticed some of them are kind of reoccurring internships that happen every year. Is it worth applying for ones that are slightly more competitive and kind of ask for more experience than you kind of feel like you have in knowing that you're quite likely to be unsuccessful? Is it worth going for it anyway? Or will it, if you are unsuccessful one year, then get more experience and reapply the next year, will your application be less competitive if they can see that you've been unsuccessful before? No. no, no. And in fact, if anything, it's more important. There was a question I, I always asked at the end of an interview um, when I was interviewing for, for young journalists. And uh, it would be, if you don't get the job, what do you do next? Because I know you've got your heart set on this. And the answer I wanted to hear was, I'll be back next month or next year or two years time until I do get the job. So uh, persistence is really, really important. So it won't reflect badly on you that you keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. Quite the contrary. We absolutely respect that. And in terms of applying, um, obviously, you know, not expected to apply for a director general role, but a trainee role. If you've got relevant experience, look at the advert. And if you think, yeah, I could actually tick those boxes, then give it a go. Um, I believe in honesty. The odds are stacked against you. But I also believe in ambition and hope. And if I'd have ever just looked at the position when I applied to the BBC and thought the odds are stacked against me, I haven't got a chance. I would never have done the great things I, I got to do with the BBC. So go for it and good luck. It's all about you and what you can do and your persistence. So yeah, give it a try. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Lisa asks, how central is impartiality to the BBC? And does this vary depending on your role? Is political party membership, a liking or a following on social media considered unfavorable? Impartiality is absolutely central to everything the BBC does. And there's been a lot of concern in particularly in recent years about impartiality being eroded and often because of social media activity. Um, the new director general, Tim da Davey, has made it absolutely fundamental that you should be impartial and I believe he's right. And if you asked a sample of BBC staff, they would probably, almost all of you, all of them tell you that they believe that's right as well. So it's very, very important to be impartial. Um, in terms of political party membership, the BBC sees it in grades. Anybody is allowed to be a member of a political party. But then there's a difference. Are you a member of a party or are you going out campaigning for the party? When your views start to become widely known and they could taint what you report, that is when the problem comes. So what you do think or say to your friends in private or if you happen to be a member of a certain party or give money to it, um, that's fine. When it's in private. But when it becomes public, that's a problem. And it's going to become an issue on social media. If, for example, I looked at a BBC correspondent and saw that they followed 20 very left-wing groups, parties or organisations, I think that would be a problem for them because it's showing an affiliation. So just be careful. We're always told, just bear in mind, if this becomes known what you're doing, will it cause your impartiality to be called into question? If it does, that's normally a red flag. Okay. Um, Lucy Richardson asks, I have a chronic health condition. I know the BBC talks a lot about accommodating things like this, but do you know if this actually translates in practice? 
Yeah, and it does. It does. I don't always support the BBC for everything it does because sometimes it's a little hypocritical. But it really is committed to sorting, pe um, to helping people from any background and any form of, of uh, disability or whatever it might be to work. BBC has a, a disability correspondent. Um, we have people I've worked with who have been blind, who are wheelchair users, who have health issues. The BBC is very, very good about supporting them. And I think in my experience of all the organisations I've worked for, probably the most supportive. So absolutely, absolutely. But you know, don't, don't just don't just worry about it. Ask the BBC, um, what would you do if I get this job? I have certain needs and they should be met. I mean, not just because of the law, but because of the commitment of the BBC. And in my experience, generally they are. Yeah, you should also look at the BBC Extend Hub. Um, they've got a whole um, area of their website dedicated to encouraging people with disability into the BBC. So have a look at have a look at these things that are available there. Yeah. Um, there is another question about impartiality. Uh, hello, that was me. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of um, obviously things like Twitter and making. Uh, making your kind of political affiliation very clear on that and that's something to kind of avoid if you want to work somewhere like the BBC. What about opinion pieces? Like will it would it be a disadvantage to have more writing experience but in opinion pieces maybe have slightly more controversial takes on things? Would that be something that interviewers would be kind of a little bit wary of? Anything that gives away your views on something which is sensitive or contentious, I would be wary of, um, simply because the BBC is a big target to certain people. And if they can use things against you, then they will. So don't give them that option. And also, as you well know, it's quite common for employers to look at someone's social media and their particular background and the things they've been writing before they will either interview you or appoint you. Um, if you're doing that well and you're getting through the application and you're going to be offered a job, why blow it on that basis? So I would just be on the side of caution if I were you. Um, with, with that in mind, a lot of students um, write quite, not controversial, but quite strong opinion pieces in, in student media. Um, you know, they're young, they're enthusiastic, they're passionate about things. Um, are they going to be judged for the stuff that they write when they're a student? You shouldn't be. Um, I mean, obviously, it depends what you're writing. If it's quite political, it might be slightly dangerous, but I can't give you a black and white answer on that. If I was appointing someone and you had written something five years ago, which was quite fruity in terms of uh, an opinion piece, I would look at it and make a judgment on it, um, what it was about. Um, I wouldn't automatically disqualify you, uh, but on the other hand, why give me that decision to make when that problem's not there? So I am the last person who's going to try and impinge on your free speech. I think it's absolutely sacred to us. But if you do want a career in the media, just think how this could be perceived in a year or two's time, how it will work for or against you. Is it worth it? It's only questions that you can answer, but it could potentially be a problem. Okay. Um, and Sophie asks, in terms of networking, is it appropriate to just message people in the job you want to do out of the blue, or would that not be received well? What's the best way to network in the media industry? The worst thing that can happen is you will be ignored, um, or you will be just told, please leave me alone, in which case, fine. Um, I would take that as, as a compliment. If somebody um, younger got in touch and said, I want to know about the media, and in fact, people have with me, and I'm always happy to try and help them along. Um, most of us uh, appreciate that we get the next generation of journalists from work experience and from getting experience from old fools like us. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. And when you go into the media, you should have the courage to be able to go up to people and ask them whether they'll talk to you, whether you get an interview or not. So there's no problem with it whatsoever. But be polite. And if somebody doesn't want to know, then fine. Leave them be. Just apologise and, and let it go at that. But there's nothing wrong with asking people. And you'd be amazed how kind some people can be and give you their time. So, yeah, give it a try. Okay, I think that was the last question, unless anybody's got any more. Well, may I say there were some great answers in that. So thank you for playing along. I think it makes it far more interesting, far more fun, and hopefully far more worthwhile for you if we actually enact the scenarios and the questions. Uh, and you gave some cracking good answers. So I'm already feeling better about the future of the BBC because clearly we've got a great pool of talent to call on for the future. So thanks for playing along with us this afternoon.
Oh, and thank you, Simon, for, for giving up your time so generously. Simon always does this for us for free, which is great, um, just to encourage younger generations into the media. So thank you very, very much, Simon. Um, and we should mention, shouldn't we, we're doing another session on media job interviews in January. Um, so if people want to come along to that. Yeah, so look out for that at the beginning of, we think it's the, the last week of January we're planning to do that one. So look out for that next term. Yeah, I think I've got 28th, Thursday 28th at three o'clock, um, media job interviews. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm um, sorry about the unmuting. I will get to the bottom of this. It might be an idea for future Zoom sessions just to make sure that you've got the most up-to-date um, version of Zoom that you can. They do send out updates regularly and the error messages that I've been getting um, have been indicating that there's a mismatch between the Zoom version that we're using for this and the Zoom version that some of you have got. So just make sure that you've got the up-to-date version for future sessions. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the kind words. Pleasure talking to you. And if we don't see you again, have a good Christmas, whatever this coronavirus Christmas may bring. Keep safe and look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.